Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Um, we will be dealing today with AI as used with health and biometric data um, in the UK and the EU. And if I show you what we're going to deal with today, we are going to cover, we're going to deal with this in two parts, actually. We're treating this webinar as part one to deal with the legal aspects and the obligations. And then part two, we're going to have an in-person, more practical workshop for those that would like to do that on the 6th of November, where we'll work through the obligations, discuss issues and talk about practical risk assessments and things like that. So today we're going to look at what biometric and health data is in this context, the uses at the moment, regulation in the UK, regulation in the EU then, what enforcement is looking like now and into the future and key takeaways, what you should be doing now, really. So there's two of us today. There's myself, I'm a partner in the data team here at Field Fisher. Um, I do 100% data protection and my specialism is anything involving health data. So all kinds of organisations, UK and globally, and the data protection laws that apply to them. Noreen, do you want to introduce yourself? Of course. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm a director in the team, in the um, um, data and privacy team here in London as well. And like Sarah, I have a focus on life science and um, digital health. We are not planning to use the full hour today. You'll be pleased to hear. Hopefully you'll get some time back and there should be time for questions. We'll deal with questions. Um, as we can, but it might be that we might follow up with you with any questions you want to deal with afterwards, or hopefully, you know, we can deal with those in the workshop later. But let's dive in. There's a lot to deal with in the next um, hour or so. So firstly, biometric data. What are we talking about when we're, we're looking at this? What do we mean by this? Well, firstly, biometric data is personal data because it relates inevitably to an identified or identifiable individual. It might also be special category data, and it becomes that when you process it for the purpose of uniquely identifying a natural person. So we're talking about the same definition for data protection laws in the UK and the EU and under the EU AI Act. And there's other legislation as well that uses the same definition. So um, Article 414 of uh, GDPR talks about um, personal data. Excuse me, I, there we are. So that is definition on the screen, personal data, and it's in three stages effectively. So we're looking at physical, physiological or behavioural characteristics. So the way someone types or walks, their voice, fingerprints, their face or emotions. And then we're talking about it being processed in a particular way. So we might talk about an audio recording of someone talking, analysed with software to detect their tone, pitch, accents or inflections. And then the third part of the definition is that it can uniquely identify or recognise someone. And this third part is where we're then tipping over into special category personal data. And remember, special category personal data could be health, but it could also be other things like racial elements or those kind of things. You'll have all of these slides um, which do have references to things that might be useful to read. I've referenced here the Ada Lovelace listening to the public report which really did an in-depth um, listening and reporting about biometrics uh, in this space and um, has worked uh, you know, with the ICO um, in this space. Uh, which might be interesting to read. I'm not going to go through the details here but it, it is a very interesting read. Thank you, Sarah. So um, on the slide, um, I'm just going to go through some examples of use of AI in biometrics. And as you can see, I have set out examples of two categories of uses of biometric data. So first of all is physical or physiological biometric identification techniques and behavioral biometric identification techniques. So these include activities such as facial recognition, iris scanning, retina analysis, keystroke analysis, and so on. 
And in some instances, these activities may be carried out by use, with using AI systems. So for example, machine learning and deep learning are used in facial recognition tools to make identification more precise, especially in relation to some demographic groups. And th this helps reduce the rates of false rejections. Um, machine learning is also used to overcome fingerprint identification issues. For example, sometimes fingerprints are not easy to read because of skin conditions or scars, and machine learning techniques can help with that. AI systems are also used in instances of keystroke analysis and voice recognition. So these are a few examples. So we're now going to move on to um, talk about the other topic we're covering today, which is health data. I'll use health data as it's a quicker term, but actually, as you can see from the slide, the GDPR talks about um, data concerning health. And under the GDPR, this means personal data related to the physical or mental health of natural persons, including the provision of health care services, which reveal information about um, his or her health status. So by way of additional context, health um, data is listed as special category data under Article 9 of the GDPR. So it will deserve an additional level of protection. And what I think it's important to focus on is to recognize that this is a broad content, um, concept. So if you look at the GDPR in recital, in recital 27, it provides a long list of types of information which will fall under the category of health data. And these include, for example, information about the natural person collected in the course of the registration or the provision of health services, health ID numbers. So, for example, you know, here in the UK, the NHS number or all the symbols that are used to uniquely identify a particular individual. Um, other examples include information derived uh, from testing or examinations of a body part or a particular um, genetic or biological sample, and, and so on and so forth. So the, the list is long. I've provided some examples on the slide for you to have a look at, but I would um, encourage you to look at Recital 27 um, if you wanted to, the full list. So as you can see, um, it is a, a, a broad context um, concept. And what the uh, definition clearly states is that these will have to be information which reveals health status um, and that will um, amount to health data. In addition to this, you may also be able to infer health data from other information that you have about the individual. However, um, is the fact that you may infer health data from the information you have from an individual always constitute um, health data? So for inst instance, you might take a picture of your employees um, for their ID security pass and they show that an individual uses a hearing aid or glasses. Is this health data? Um, in the UK, the ICO um, provides useful guidance on this point um, and it allows for a flexible interpretation. So whether you have, um, you will have to consider such personal data as special category data will depend on a number of factors according to the ICO guidance. So it will depend on, on whether you are um, your processing activities intend to make such inference or such link to special category data, or it might also uh, de be dependent on whether you will treat someone differently because of this. So um, in the example above, the fact that the users uses glasses or a hearing aid does not really affect the processing activity that you were trying to achieve in relation to security. So in this case, it, it may be arguable that it doesn't constitute health data. However, there is a fine line and you will need to assess um, these uh, use cases on, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, last point I wanted to mention is that this issue of inf inferring um, special category data uh, from um, certain information available in relation to particular individual this was brought to the limelight uh, by the European Court of Justice um, in a case regarding a European individual whose spouse was named in a public uh, available register. The spouse in that case was a person of the same sex, so from that information one could infer the sexual orientation of the individuals. 
Um, so the European Court of Justice confirmed that um, the publication of such information did constitute processing of special category data. So we do need to look out for these potential inferences that we might make. Um, there's also a, a final point actually, which is the potential crossover between health data and biometric data. So uh, as you may be able to infer, infer health data or health information, from biometric data that you collect, for instance, in relation to iris reading or the individual's gait. Um, I'll now um, hand over to Sarah, who will provide some examples of the use of AI in health. Yes, thanks, Nuria. I've got a slide here with some examples, but I'm sure we all know that the potential for this is unlimited. Um, everywhere around the world recognises the huge potential for innovation in this area <clears throat> and the real benefit to society. And we're seeing uh, really exciting examples here with support for GPs in prescribing drugs, personalised medicine, meaning that treatment is more effective, um, support in triaging in emergency situations, a predictive analysis, the drug discovery possibilities are endless, uh, and in surgery using AI robotics, um, all sorts of examples. It's, it's a really exciting possibility, I think, uh, with AI. So having set up what we're broadly talking about, um, which we are involved in discussions about when data becomes within the definitions of biometric or health data, We'll then look at what the regulation is looking like in this space. And first of all, I'm going to deal with regulation in the UK. So both biometrics and health data. We have um, lots of guidance from the ICO, actually. Guidance on biometrics and uh, on AI and the ICO saying this is part of their three year priority. We're seeing lots of work, um, lots of uh, uh, cooperation from the ICO in their, in their priority spaces here and uh, the guidance on biometrics is fairly recent and um, a really good read if you are looking to go into that space or already involved in it. There is other guidance on AI um, around Europe. We're going to talk about the EU AI Act later and there's significant guidance promised in various areas under that legislation at various timescales. So there will be lots more to come. In the UK, obviously, we've got a, a new government, so um, things might change slightly. Under the previous regime, we've been told that um, regulation for AI or would be probably by sector with particular regulators dealing with issues in their in their industry and regulators had produced reports earlier in the year about their priorities and plans but this government has said it is going to regulate there will be some legislation in relation to AI whether it will be as broad as the EU AI Act we will see this government has also indicated an intention to align more closely with Europe so whether it will um, follow similar formats to, as to the EU AI Act, we will see. Um, we've also been promised new data protection regula regulation. Obviously, the previous regime had, had gone so far down the road with a new data protection bill. Again, we don't know what this will involve, but uh, we'll see. I've heard rumours that some sort of regulation in this area might be seen, um, at least in draft before the end of the year, but uh, let's wait and see. Otherwise, we've had indications over a number of years about the intention of rele relevant stakeholders or what they'd like to see or what we intend to see happening. And I think much of this will be taken into account um, and will be relevant. Particularly, we've seen various things from the MHRA and I will summarise those um, on the next couple of slides. So. Um, the MHRA produced a policy paper in April of this year on the impact of AI on the regulation of medical pro products. This outlined the intention to implement a proportionate pro-innovation approach to regulation that will ensure safety and responsibility and support aims for the UK to be a leader in best practice. Um, I think this would be, uh, it, it's likely that any regulation or legislation is likely to consider this and certainly the ICO is aware of of what the MHRA intends or is saying in any space. 
we had a bit of an indication from the new government about some intentions in, in another uh, space. They uh, produced a report that was called Build an NHS for the Future that talked, touched a little bit on health um, and AI in health in particular. They set out their plans to how the part and harness the power of AI to transform diagnostic services, in particular uh, looking at scanners, AI embedded scanners, um, detecting cancer, for example. Um, the MHRA in May also launched an AI airlock to address challenges for regulating medical devices that use AI. Um, there's a pilot project seeking to implement a regulatory sandbox model, um, which is, is obviously a, a, a really good way of testing out um, what might be needed. Um, further MHRA um, guidance published in June, software and AI as a medical device, including principles to inform development of good machine learning practice. We have the original national AI strategy, which was published by the previous government in September 2021. Obviously, it remains to be seen how much of that change from now on, but the aim at that point was to position the UK as a global superpower in AI. And although this isn't UK specific, we have the World Health Organization outlining considerations for regulation of Article Intelligence for Health, which was published in October last year. So quite a lot of guidance and indications about what should or should not, not be happening. And you know, it remains to be seen how this might influence um, future regulation in the UK. Thank you, Sarah. So um, we are now going to focus on the EU regulation of the use of AI, which affects the, the use of AI in health and in biometrics. So there are many regulatory, regulatory initiatives and guidance documents as well in the EU on this topic, but time is limited. So we thought we are going to focus on certain aspects of the act itself given that it's such a comprehensive piece of legislation and it is important to become familiar with it as soon as possible. So um, just before we get into the, the meaty bits, um, it's important to remember that the Act was formally approved in June. It wasn't pu published until July of this year and it, it came into force uh, 20 days after publication in the uh, official journal. So that was um, about end of end of July then. After that, it becomes applicable in a staggered way, as you can see on the slide. So the prohibitions, which we are going to talk about briefly, and also provisions on AI literally, will become applicable six months after the um, the the I uh, the um, act uh, becomes applicable. So that uh, comes into force. So that that is only in, in a few months' time. The general purpose AI provisions will be applicable in 12 months, so that's summer of next year. The majority of the provisions, including the rules on AI risk systems in Annex 3, which we will explain in, in a few moments, they will become applicable in 24 months, so we're looking at summer 26. And finally, the provisions on um, high-risk AI systems set out in Annex 1, will become applicable in 36 months. So as you can see, a staggered approach. Let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. So um, I'm not planning to go through each actor in detail, but uh, we thought it would be useful for us to get used to the terminology used and generally speaking, what's the role of each actor under the AI Act. So as you can see, the term operator is used generally to mean many of um, any of the actors. And for the purposes of our presentation, the most important categories here will be the provider and the deployer. The provider um, develops the AI system or has it developed by another with a view to placing it in the market under its name or trademark or who adapts a general purpose AI to a specific intended purpose. At the same time, the deployer is the organization using the AI system in a professional context. What's very important to remember is that some organizations will have more than one role 
and they might act as a deployer and a provider for different use cases. So you, you will need to work out early on what role you fulfill, because this will determine your obligations under the Act. Um, in addition to that, each organization using AI when processing health and biometric data will have a role under, the, on the one hand, the AI Act, and they will also have a role under the GDPR. And the AI Act explicitly sets out in its recital 10 that it will not interfere in the obligations of GDPR controllers. The authorized representatives will be EU-based organizations receiving a mandate from providers outside of the EU to perform obligations under the Act on their behalf. And as you can imagine, importers and distributors have different roles within the supply chain in relation to placing an AI system into the EU market. So, um, moving on to the next slide now. So, after this brief introduction, we will move on to discuss the different risk levels under the Act in relation to AI use cases involving health data and biometrics. So, I will address biometrics first and then Sarah will cover health. However, before I do this, I just wanted to um, provide a few thoughts on the um, topic of AI Act risk categorization. So, the EU AI Act is a principle based piece of legislation. It protects principles like human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination, fairness, social environmental and environmental well-being and so on. These are listed in recital 27 of the Act. So what we have is uh, a piece of legislation that protects fundamental rights and principles of our society, but at the same time acknowledging that these rights and principles are not absolute and, and because of that setting out a risk-based approach. So, and, and this will sound familiar because it's similar to what the GDPR does. Um, so we thought that we'll provide this slide because it's useful, uh, it provides a description of the risk levels in the AI Act, and obviously, as Sarah said, you are going to get a copy of the slides. However, I'm not going to go um, through each of these categories, so we I'm going to focus on the two top categories. Um, uh, prohibited use cases and high risk use cases. So when we talk about uh, prohibited use cases, these are prohibited from an EU policy standpoint and you simply cannot do these things. In terms of high risk, these are categories that present a significant risk to individuals and will, uh, whilst there are circumstances that these uh, systems can be deployed they are heavily regulated. So both prohibited and high risk categories under the AI Act involve um, use cases of biometric data. So let's take a closer look at the prohibited use cases um, and we can see them on, on the slide here. So if we look at Article 5 of the AI Act, it sets out the AI use cases which are prohibited under the Act a reminder that such prohibitions will be applicable in a matter of months, as I was saying a few minutes ago. Article 5 prohibits the placing on the market, putting into service for this uh, a specific purpose or the use of a number of um, use cases. So first of all, um, real-time remote biometric identification systems in publicly accessible spaces, except in certain circumstances by law enforcement. So, for instance, when there is a strictly um, when this is strictly necessary for the targeted search of a specific victim of abduction or human trafficking, that may be allowed. But generally speaking, it is a prohibited use. Even when the use by law enforcement agencies is not prohibited, it's subject to restrictions when using it. For instance such systems shall be deployed only to confirm the identity of the specifically targeted individual and it will normally be subject to authorization by a judicial authority or an independent administrative authority. It will also require certain limitations, uh, for instance, 
in relation to the period of time for which it might be used. So just giving you a flavor of the fact that even when allowed, it's on very restricted basis. Um, and, and as I was saying, actually, if um, a law enforcement authority is able to use um, the AI system for this purpose, it must have completed a fundamental rights impact assessment um, under, under the Act. The next uh, prohibited um, use case I wanted to mention is systems to create or expand facial recognition databases through the untargeted scraping of facial images from the internet or CCTV footage. Later, we'll, we will explain the, the um, a particular enforcement case of or Clearview and how it was fined by European uh, regulators for carrying out similar um, activities. In terms of the next use case I wanted to touch on is biometric categorization systems. These categorize individually um, natural persons based on the biometric data to deduce or infer sensitive or protected characteristics like their race, political opinions, sexual orientation, and so on. This prohibition does not cover any labeling or filtering of lawfully acquired biometric data sets, such as images based on biometric data or categorizing of biometric data in the area of law enforcement. So again, we have a law enforcement um, use case that is, is uh, possible. An example of this might be the sorting of images according to hair color or eye color, which can be done, for example, um, by, by a police force. The next um, system I wanted to touch on is the uh, systems for inferring emotions of a natural person, which might be done um, with the use of biometrics, um, as you know. And this is prohibited in the areas of, work, of workplace or in education um, settings, except where the use of the AI system is intended to be put in place or into the market for medical or safety reasons. So we can go now to the next slide and we are going to look at high risk use cases. And high risk use cases are, can be allocated or classified in three main buckets. And these are product or safety components of products and where EU legislation requires third party conformity assessment. Um, these focus on areas of safety of humans, medical devices, heavy industry, and so on. So as you can see in the slide, these are set out in Article 6.1, and Annex 1 provides a list of the relevant EU legislation. It's quite a long list. Um, the next bucket um, refers to AI systems use um, cases listed in Annex 3 of the AI Act. Um, for example, and this, again, uh, provides a very long list. But it, for example, includes systems used for biometric identification, critical infrastructure um, in educational and vocational training, and systems that um, automate the hiring process um, and triage CVs. There is an exception to the Annex 3 categorization, setting out that if the system does not pose a significant risk of harm um, to the health, safety, or fundamental rights of the natural person, a provider can document this and on that basis exclude the, the system from the Act's uh, obligations for um, high-risk um, systems. However, there is, as always with legislation, there is an exception to this exception. And this applies if you conduct profiling on people with the data that you use for your AI system. Then this will always be high-risk. Um, However, this only applies in relation to Annex 3 use cases, but if you carry out profiling in this context, you will not be able to benefit from the exception that I just explained. So for the purposes of our webinar today, I would like to focus on high-risk AI systems um, use cases using biometrics. These are set out in Annex 3, um, so the second bucket that I've just described, and I've, on the right-hand side of the slide, I've provided some examples. Um, Annex 3 has a specific section on biometrics, so these are the main use cases that are relevant to us today. 
um, in the biometric section, you'll find use cases which overlap with some of the prohibited use cases. So they, these use cases are only high risk if, they, if the use is permitted under union or local law. So if it falls under one of the prohibited cases under Article 5, it will not be allowed and it will not be a high risk um, use case. But if it doesn't, it will um, be classified as high risk. So as you can see here, the, the use of biometrics in this context, it will be either prohibited or high risk. Which, what, what are these use cases? So just very quickly, because we've gone through them uh, when looking at the prohibited uses. So these are remote biometric identification systems, AI systems intended to be used for biometric categorization, and also AI systems intended to be used for emotion recognition. Um, you will see that in the slide I have provided examples under the category of others. And this is because as you read through Annex 3, there are a few instances where you can envisage situations that might also involve the processing of biometric data. For example, in I'll just give this example, in an education or vocational training setting, um, one of the AI systems intended to be high risk are those who are intended to detect prohibited behavior during tests uh, in the context or within an educational or vocational training institution um, settings. So perhaps this is not what was originally intended, but I could see instances here where the speed of typing, if it, that's monitored, may help you detect whether the individual is cheating or copying from somewhere if the typing is too quick. Um, but as I say, these are not the main use cases. The main use cases are obviously in the biometric section. Um, so what does this mean in practice? What does this mean um, to actually be a high risk system? Um, this means in practice that you will be subject to many more obligations under the AI Act. And I'm not going to go through these in detail because Sarah is covering these later on as a sort of um, wrapping up the, this section. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Nuria. So yes, a lot of this will be similar for health data. The process will be similar. So Nuria mentioned the timelines for the EU AI Act. Um, those apply, specific elements apply to health, uh, where they're assessed uh, according to risk status. She also set out the main actors, that will be the same. So those are, are preliminary steps, deciding what your role is with any AI. Are you a provider or a deployer in particular, which might give you some obligations? And then um, Nuria shared the slide that showed a little bit some examples, the hierarchy of sort of risk assessment in, in this, uh, under this legislation. So when we're looking at health, it's very similar. We'll start um, first with prohibited actions, then high risk actions, and then I will go on to talk about what that actually means in, in the whole context. So for prohibited AI systems in the health space, um, we're looking at the same examples and it's where it impacts on health. So subliminal techniques to distort behaviour and cause significant harm, for example, on physical or psychological health. Um, there's a, an exception here if it's legitimate medical treatment. So here, this is where it's sort of trying to affect decisions. You might have audio or video stimuli like uh, VR equipment, um, but the exemption would exclude for example, any treatment in the mental health, health space that might come within that definition. Next, we've got exploiting vulnerabilities to distort behaviour and cause significant harm. Again, here, an exception for legitimate medical treatment. Social scoring, another area, um, for example, this might affect people with disabilities, so affecting the health space. And emotion detection, again, can be affecting the health space. And again, an, an exception for, for medical reasons. So that's where it, it might be prohibited to begin with. The next level, as Nuria indicated, is high risk. And this might seem familiar. It's the same as Nuria's slide. It's the same process to determine whether something's high risk, but different 
Neurally referred to as buckets, different buckets might be uh, relevant here to any health data. So the first bucket, Article 6.1 that Neuro referred to, we might have some health aspects, um, some products, services involving AI uh, that might be uh, involved here. Uh, we might be looking at sort of clinical management of patients, diagnosis, therapeutic decisions and precision medicine within this EU harmonisation legislation requiring third party conformity assessment. So we're going to have quite a lot of health related things involving AI that are immediately determined to be high risk. So this is quite a sort of a technical assessment. You need to look at the actual provisions within the EU AI to see whether you, you are picked up in any one of these categories as being high risk. That's one bucket. Um, Nuri referred to the second bucket, which is an annex to the legislation that sets out lots of categories, and there may be categories that are picked up uh, within this, um, within the health space. I've got some examples on the side. We've got profiling may not be quite as relevant, but examples here, um, IVF is likely to be treat, deemed to be high risk. Medical devices, class 2A and above, for example, AI-assisted medical image diagnosis public assessment of eligibility for healthcare services, risk assessment and pricing of life and health insurance, emergency triage, medical training assessment, asylum health risk screening, healthcare workforce management, some emotion recognition may involve health healthcare aspects. Interestingly, Nuria mentioned bucket two, the Annex three definitions. The exemption there is you can say you're not high risk if you're listed within Annex three, if you're not uh, involving risk to um, health effectively. So impliedly, all other categories involve um, risks to health will be high risk. So there will be other aspects indirectly affecting health. Um, that um, are high risk under the EU AI Act that I've not referred to. I've referred to specific AI dealing with health as aspects in particular. You can, you know, reading between the lines, look at this and think some lower risk aspects of health that won't come within this kind of categorization, picking up from these buckets are going to be things like drug discovery, or non-clinical research or earlier stage, earlier stage clinical trials. So it really will be critical that you look at what you're doing, look at your role, look at what the AI system is doing and assessing your risk to determine what that means. And what does that mean? Well, if you are deemed to have a high risk system involved, I'm going to ignore your role. But high risk systems under the EU AI Act have significant extra requirements. So I've listed, um, this comes from various articles, there's lots of information for all of these, and there will be um, further guidance under the EU AI Act. Um, safe to say that the guidance is timed, there are deadlines for guidance, and the planning anticipates that guidance will come or any particular section of the legislation before it comes into force. So there will be more information that will explain a, a lot of what we're talking about today. But you can see the extra requirements relate to risk management systems, data and data governance, technical documentation and record keeping, transparency, having human oversight and uh, accountability, accuracy, quality, corrective actions, having authorised representatives, fundamental rights impact assessment, so fair amount of risk assessment needed under this legislation, conformity in various areas and registration, post-market monitoring and reporting of serious incidents. So really significant obligations if you come within the high risk aspects. Um, and this is what we're doing with clients really at the moment. So um, Nuria didn't talk, go further than uh, what's prohibited or high risk, I will now um, just for examples. So beyond high risk, we might then have general purpose AI models, which might have two standards of risk under the legislation standard or systemic. I'm not going to talk a lot about systemic risk. It, risk here, further guidance is expected. But again, there are additional requirements here if you do fall into general purpose AI models with systemic risk. There's model evaluation risk mitigation and management and cybersecurity. 
This in the health space examples here might mean uh, language models, so diagnostics, clinical data management. After that, um, ignoring the risk completely, so ignoring whether you're high risk or not, um, there are specific transparency requirements where you're interacting with individuals or generating content. So these additional obligations here are about giving information, so transparency information downstream, informing users that involves AI and making it clear the output should be machine readable and recognizable as AI. And health examples for here, you know, where, and interacting with individuals, it could be virtual health assistant and chatbots. So that's really where the regulation in the EU is for health and biometrics at the moment. Thank you, Sarah. There's so much to digest. Um, so as part three of our session, um, we thought that we would spend a few minutes um, discussing enforcement, um, just to give a quick flavour at how active regulators are in the field, um, both in the EU and the UK. So we can move on to the next one. Thank you. So the topics we have discussed today are likely to be under the radar of regulators. There, there is no doubt about that, not least because they relate to, in many cases, special category data. So it's data that deserves more protection. And also because some of the cases that we'll discuss are quite high profile. And um, this is a topic, the use of AI is a topic that in, in the last couple of years, it has really attracted a lot of media attention and are a concern for the society as a whole. So it's it's not surprising that regulators are upping their game on and targeting th this type of activities. There are many examples of um, enforcement activities, but we will focus today on um, enforcement activities against Clearview and Serco. Um, we will um, discuss other regulatory activities in the EU and the UK in particular ChatGBT task force uh, in the EU and the ICO's investigation on the MyAI chatbot earlier this year. And lastly, on, on this slide, I added a, boot, a, a bullet at the bottom um, under the sort of future enforcement of the AI Act. And this is just to remind ourselves, obviously the AI Act hasn't been enforced yet. This is to remind ourselves that this is coming down the line so that the, the, the enforcement activities we're going to uh, be discussing in the next few minutes are under the GDPR, but the AI Act will be enforced, another piece of legislation that will, will be enforced uh, and may affect you, and they might, these two uh, pieces of legislation may be enforced in parallel. So let's move on and, and spend a couple of minutes talking about the clear view decisions. So this case is particularly interesting because we have three decisions in three consecutive years. So we have a decision by the Italian Data Protection Authority in 2022, one by the ICO in the UK in 23, and now in the last couple of weeks, a decision from the Netherlands Data Protection Authority uh, in 24. So um, these decisions have some common themes, which we will touch on. So Clearview, for those who don't know, is a, a US-based organization which business model is based on the collection of images of people's faces over the internet and social media platforms from you know, publicly available sources to create a database. Individuals are not informed of, about this and then the company then provides services um, to their, its own customers based on um, the use of facial recognition AI systems. Customers, including law enforcement customers, can then upload an image onto an app and check it against the big database of images. So the app then provides matching or similar images and information about the websites the images originally came from. So as you can see, this is um, linked to the prohibited use um, of AI system under the AI Act that I explained earlier. So in terms of the fines, the, they are high. So the data protection, uh, the Italian Data Protection Authority issued a fine of 20 million euros. It also imposed a, fan, a ban on um, further collection and processing. Um, it ordered the erasure of the data and it ordered the designation of a representative in the EU. 
the infringing activity um, found by the Italian Data Protection Authority, but that, as I said, it's, it's similar in the other cases, is that personal data was held without lawful basis, and this included biometric data. The legitimate interest did not apply as a legal basis because the test wasn't passed. Um, it also found a breach of uh, various GDPR principles, including transparency, storage limitation, and purpose limitation, and the fact that uh, an EU representative was not in place. Um, in May 23, the ICO fined Clearview 7.5 million pounds, and it identified similar infringements, as I have said. And um, important to remember that this is not just a European initiative, but actually the ICO carried out this investigation jointly with the Australian Data Protection Regulator. In the UK, the case has gone on for a while. There is controversy as the ICOs, uh, in relation to the ICO's jurisdiction. So the fine was appealed and the first tier tribunal then considered that Clearview was not subject to UK law. Um, and then the ICO was planning to, to appeal. So I believe it has appealed this decision. So I won't go into detail, uh, any detail on this, but just to flag that there is some controversy in terms of jurisdictional issues around this decision too. And in terms of the um, the file, uh, the recent fine in the Netherlands, um, it was uh, Clivio was fined at 30.5 million euros. And in that particular case, the investigation was started after three individuals complained about the fact that the company had not the, um, granted um, these individuals access to the data when they had submitted a subject access request under the GDPR, even though Clear Review um, dismissed the allegations. So it's important to highlight that these enforcement activities are under the GDPR, again, as I was saying earlier, and not under the AI Act. I'll now hand over to Sarah, um, who will wrap up the session. Thank you, Nuria. Yes, just highlighting some other um, reports, investigations, enforcement from regulators in the AI space. So the first one is a decision in the UK against Circo Leisure fairly recently, um, where the organisation had been using facial recognition, fingerprint scanning to monitor workers' attendance. Um, the consequences of this affected workers' pay. Um, your pay was calculated on the basis of this and there was no alternative, no choice about this. And the ICO has prevented Serco from doing that. They've been told to stop using this. Um, there, I think the, the, one of the main reasons for this is there's, there's much less intrusive methods of doing this. Widely used versions such as ID cards or FOBs or, or, or things like that, where you you uh, clock in and clock out effectively or gain access uh, and leave uh, uh, premises. Um, so, uh, not entirely surprising, this decision, um, and a fairly recent one, I think, probably the, the first of, of many to come where investigation will be done. Other things that we have in this space, we have the Chat GPT Task Force report from Europe. It's a preliminary report, um, and it's dealing with large language models and does touch on health data or special category data which would include health data in the context of data scraping so where you're scraping data and might um, include accidentally or, or in whatever way health data or special category data and the safeguards that may be needed the report deals with privacy issues largely and is a good um, good way of, of enforcing the message that this is largely about you know whole privacy compliance so the report deals with lawfulness of data collection and processing you know the collection itself the pre-processing training the output and training fairness transparency accuracy and data subject rights so very familiar areas in privacy uh, compliance nothing unusual nothing new for, for ai use in this context um, and as I said, a preliminary report, so we, we expect to, to hear more uh, more on this. Clients are using this, asking us about the safeguards that are recommended here and, you know, embedding this into PPIAs and assessments they're doing of uh, projects that involve this kind of um, models. The, the next one to refer to is the SNAP 
MIA catbot investigation again in the UK and again fairly recently. Um, this uh, said that privacy risks should be protected in the context of generative AI and they should be addressed before uh, systems come to market. So uh, SNAP uh, had to uh, undertake a DPIA, for example, and demonstrate more specifically that they have considered privacy, privacy risks and addressed them to satisfy uh, the ICO. So that was enforcement uh, at the moment. And Nuria mentions that there will be uh, further additional uh, enforcement under the EU AI Act eventually. So we have a question. Um, in the context of clinical trials, but I can make it more generally relevant, the question was, um, how can you decide if there's AI, so in this context, um, AI being used in clinical trials for, for providing information and results, how can you decide who's responsible for it, who, who has the responsibility, who's got the obligation, who does what? So the process um, that we're doing with clients is to decide what your role is, so identify yourself, as a provider or a deployer or, or anything else. Identify, understand what the AI is doing. Um, assess what risk level it comes under under the EU AI Act. And that determines the uh, obligations and who has the obligations. And then there is you know, a lot of work to be done, processes, documents, training, risk assessment, those kind of things. So that, that's broadly the process to be undertaken. And please come and speak to us if you want to discuss that any further. So the takeaways at this point, today we've dealt with the legal side to this very much, the, the obligations, the framework effectively for this. Part two, we're going to deal with more practical aspects of this. So um, assessing where you come within the EU AI Act, for example, and what work would need to be done. Um, so at the moment, takeaways would be that if you're involved with biometrics and health data, inevitably these are likely to be high risk activities with enhanced obligations. If we're looking at an EU type scope, then start your assessments now for the EU AI Act. There's a lot to be done. Compliance frameworks will be needed, but the good news is that much of your GDPR compliance work may be leveraged. Um, it may not be that you're starting from scratch. There's going to be more EU AI guidance coming. We've got deadlines for that. We're, we're looking for that. Uh, we're expecting more guidance in the UK too, and certainly more regulation, and we, we will be updating about that. So monitor the UK developments with what's coming and register interest in our future events if you want to. Well, this will be a series of things on this topic. There's such a lot to talk about. And it's been great to, uh, to talk to you uh, today about this. As um, promised, that's it. We, this um, QR code takes you to our website if you're interested in registering for anything or uh, looking at the previous series of Privacy for Life Science webinars that we've done in this space. Um, but as promised, we are giving you some time back today and that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.